to local residents. This, this is going on up and down the country. Because you see these reports on TV about people fed up with A3 and A4 establishments, filling a space, filling a space. And what ensues with, with these situations, but what worries me more than anything, that you have a local authority putting one set of data in, and yet you get an independent report which totally contradicts it. Okay, I think there were some common themes between um, those questions. Let me just deal with the one first, which is why is there only uh, Labour members uh, of the committee uh, here? As I sort of said at the beginning, obviously you'll, you'll all know that there's a debate going on in Parliament at the moment about the whole uh, Brexit deal. There's a, an absolutely key uh, vote tomorrow. And one of our colleagues, uh, one of the Conservative members of the committee, was due to uh, be here today, but unfortunately, because he's, he's a parliamentary private secretary for the Treasury Department. They're answering the debate today. And so at the la so he then had to stay back because that's part of his uh, other jobs. Then it's in the nature of MPs that our jobs involve, uh, you know, sometimes we're trying to be in two places at once, being on the committee and being in Parliament. And I just think it's, it is really unfortunate that we're not a balanced group of uh, members uh, here today. But I don't think that they kind of thought, oh my goodness, we're too frightened to come to Liverpool, but who knows? Um, it's just unfortunate that none of them are here, and I, you know, I regret that. Neil, I think you raised a really uh, important point about air quality. And of course, one of the reasons why there's a lot of pressure on local authorities, uh, particularly uh, in some of our big cities, to tackle air quality, because they're breaking uh, the regulations, this, in fact, EU regulations, about the quality of our air. And we, we were part of a report, we did a cross uh, select committee report alongside the health committee, uh, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and the Environmental Audit Committee on air quality last year and we made some very clear recommendations to government about what they need to do uh, to support, like, I mean essentially the government have kind of pushed it down to local authorities and said you sort it out uh, and we said that they hadn't done uh, a good enough job and you know, we produced our report and we have to keep going back to it because sometimes government don't, uh, even where you've got four select committees working together and making some very clear views about how we need to tackle air quality and I agree with you. And it isn't just about air quality, it's also about carbon emissions, you know, and the bigger picture on climate change. So I completely agree with you. And it is a bit chicken and egg. It's people are not going to leave their cars behind and use public transport if the public transport isn't affordable enough and convenient enough. Um, you know, and it's a, it is a difficult uh, one and some places around the country are really trying to do that but they've got to have the support of government of course to give them the powers that they need and to give them the funding uh, that they need but certainly as a select committee those are issues that we're very much uh, you know, looking at and trying to work with but it's really helpful to hear your feedback. In relation to, to the final um, question which obviously was about uh, planning and again you're, you're touching on issues about congestion about the ability to use public transport in I don't know if you were here for our session uh, earlier but we were asking both Mersey Travel and the uh, bus operators is when developments are being planned whether it's big housing estates or whether it's new industrial sites how are you making sure that they're properly served by public transport so that people have the option not to travel by car so that they can use uh, public uh, transport. I, I can't really comment on the specifics about the question you raised about why the independent, um, you know, an independent transport provider and the council had a different view about those uh, issues. But of course, if the council have produced uh, a report or commissioned a report, I would think that would be available to you under the Freedom of Information uh, request, or it, it should be, particularly if it's in relation to uh, planning. So maybe that's a question to go and ask your local. Uh, councillor, I'm afraid I don't know uh, the answer to it, but I do know, you know, from my own local uh, area, is that we quite often have uh, discussions and debates with the council about whether uh, the the, pla the transport considerations, the impact on congestion, on car parking, on on, on transport, is properly considered when they're considering uh, new developments. So I certainly recognise um, your concern. Right. We've got time, I think, for another round of questions. How many am I going to manage to get through? Um, oh, right. Oh, that's getting me more and more. Right, OK, let's try and get a, a range of them. So the gentleman here with the checky shirt on, uh, gentleman there with the long hair. Um, let's get 
um, the taxi, Mr. Taxi person there. I know you, you wanted to ask a question. Uh, I better have someone from right at the back, hadn't I? Um, oh, sorry, I'm going to have the lady at the front because we've not got a good gender balance. Right, there we go. We've got four. I'll, if I can fit another round in, I will. Fire away. Hi, um, my name is Mark Osborne. I'm the chair of the Transport Planning Society in, um, in Merseyside. I say that because I don't want to be my, uh, my employer's short, name. That's great, but the shorty committee questions are more we can fit in. So I, Thank you. Let's um, put um, kind of an area for study for an inquiry, and that's around land use and transport. I want to say, as a transport planner, I always find that we have to respond to what land use is put forward. We have very little influence in how land is actually developed and how it actually works for transport. So that causes long-term issues once a development is actually built. Thank you for that short, short question. Yeah. Hi, <coughs> hi. My name is uh, Jacob Harris. So, so when the buses were deregulated back in the 1980s, one of the primary purposes of it was to create comp competition in the bus market. Now, what I've seen in, in parts of Liverpool is quite the opposite. So, stagecoach got like a mono near monopoly on buses in Kirby, whilst Reeve, Reeve have got a monopoly on buses like, like it was like, like Tube, Book Heights, and, and and on the airport buses. So, given that 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 what has happened is like the opposite. Is it? Time for a rethink of how the bus market is like run and regulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lillian, my name's Tony Mullane. Uh, I've stood up so that you can all see me because obviously from the front it's difficult. Um, I am a bus operator. I operate Taxi One. That's the name of the bus. It runs from St John's Lane on Liverpool match days and it picks up passengers and takes them to Liverpool Football Club. We charge people £2. Anybody who's got their old age pension to pass can travel in our taxis for free. And what we do is we give competitions here to Stagecoach, right? But it's got to be used with this licence, which is what I've got. A licence is issued by the Department of Transport and all the people on the Whittle or anybody on this side of the water who's got no bus, my mum lives up in Lydia, she's got very little provision at the weekend no provision at all <coughs> she could use a taxi the same way as I provide the taxi service but me as you travel are not looking at the best practice guide from DFT now we're very lucky that Graham's on the panel here because he comes from the North East and up there they've got Nexus and they have taxi buses. It's an opportunity. We know that Stagecoach and Arriva are not going to be providing you guys with a bus service when they're not making any money. But if you've got a taxi with six or eight seats that runs along the route, he can make money. And I've actually done this now for six years. Took 120,000 passengers at Taxi One. And not many people know about it apart from the football fans. But it's an opportunity for the government to get the message out throughout the country, we need to save money, so we need to use the subsidies better than what we're using them at the moment. So I want the committee to recommend DFT get the message out throughout the UK that there is a huge workforce there, massive workforce of taxi drivers. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm sitting next to you. You're telling us that we should all get out the city centre, but if you're in the town on a Saturday or a Sunday and you've got no provision, I'll pick you up, but it won't cost you nothing. Thank you, Tony. Um, what, I'm going, what I'm minded to do is like just take more questions. Even if we don't get time to answer them all, at least we can hear what you've had to say so we don't miss it. So, where else have we got? Um, right. Hello, my name is Bonnie Owens. I'm from Wiston, uh, which is part of Nosley. Recently, our bus stopped altogether. So, Nosley Council and Red Row Housing got together to refund the bus that was going to stop. And at the moment, I think it's working reasonably well. Um, now that serves up to uh, Broad Green Hospital and Western Hospital and part of Prescott. But it only when it didn't used to go into the bus station, but now previous people who have visually impairment ask, well, why can't it go to the bus station as well, like it, the previous bus used to do? So now it does, but it does go around about, what, around, around about routes. Now, where I live also, they're hoping to build a garden village, which is going to be 1,600 houses. 
I live, already live on a big housing estate which was built 24 years ago. Now when I went to live there 24 years ago, we only had two little buses, one going to Prescott, one going to Wiston. Um, since then, nothing's really changed. It's every half an hour, and consequently, this other bus has stopped, and now Red Road stepped in. As far as I know, they stepped in because they're building another big housing estate in Highton, so therefore, they probably thought, well, not everyone's got a car on that particular route, the new, <coughs> the new housing estate. Um, and from a visually impaired point of view, I can't see to drive. I do need to go out sometimes without my husband who does drive. I don't always want to depend on my husband all of the time. And what that man's just said about the taxi that he's su suggest they're talking about, I think that's a great idea also, because that could go to the door if possible and pick people up as well. So that's another good, great idea. And, and also where I live, every Everywhere you go, if you want to go to Kirby, Highton, Prescott, Halewood, everywhere you go, it's two buses, no matter where you go. And from, from Highton to Kirby, it costs £14 in taxi one way. And also, how can people with other different disabilities, when the government are cutting back on CLA or they're cutting back on independent living uh, PIP, and we expect people with disabilities to be able to afford to get around. I mean, I think you, you made all the, the really important points there, which is that <coughs> bus cuts really impact on certain groups of people. They impact on people who can't afford to run a car, on people who can't drive, either because they, you know, they're, they're too young they're, 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 or they've got a disability that prevents them from doing it. And it's, it's really, you know, that you made a really important point. I'm glad to hear that your bus service has been saved as a result of the partnership. Long, I don't know how long. Yeah, no, absolutely recognise that. Right, let's take some more questions, just so we can hear your questions, really. Um, so, the gentleman right in the back with the black... And, and another, there's another gentleman at the back with the tie on. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Chairman. That's it. Yeah. Being polite. Keep Dave from Um I agree with the lady behind me. I also live in Bonnessey and uh, have trouble with the local bus service, A1. But what I want to comment on, is for 20 odd years I belong to the Mersey Travel Advisory Panel. There are a couple of people here, he's got some meetings upstairs. I'd like to ask for you to recommend that they put them back up there on a monthly basis, first <coughs> Monday in a month, and get all these people in talking about their own bus routes. No cabinet ministers, you'll go around the country. This is very relevant for anybody in the country, this. <laughs> Do they still have the advisory panel or not? No, they finished about five years ago, but then he's had the same will, Liverpool City, Boodle, Southport, Kirby, not, not Kirby, Prescott, Hyden, and St. Helens on a th every three months. And he didn't advertise them very well. About 50 to, 50 to 100 people used to come here, first floor, like this, in ta grand tables on the person from Mersey Travel. But, and Liam Robinson used to chair them. I'd like to suggest you recommend this for anywhere in the country, but especially here to get these meetings back again for the public to discuss on a regular basis any problems that they have. Well look, we're, we're making notes of all the questions that come up today and Thank we'll you, certainly Madam send Chair. them to Mersey Travel so they'll see that suggestion and uh, hopefully they'll respond positively to it. Right, so what about, um, so there's a, a lady there, uh, yeah, and then one, and a lady, just in front of me, sorry I'll get both of you, sorry. Um, and then a gentleman right at the back. Oh, sorry, there's someone else to go up at the back. Hi there, it's, it's Ben Haddock here. Just, just a quick question. What's the committee's position on the freezing of fuel duty for the ninth consecutive year and therefore the consequential <coughs> drop in public transport use? Okay. Yeah, and then the lady who's got the microphone. Given that Theresa May refused to enact the part of the 2010 Equality Act, that was all about socio-economic disadvantage and inequality, which means that this isn't included in any equality impact assessment on decisions made about provision of public transport in the most disadvantaged com communities like Everton, where we're from. How does the government ensure that there is good transport provided in communities like ours? Like other people have said, we've had a desperately needed bus cancelled and we cannot get any answers 
from Maisie Travel why the people in the uh, disadvantaged areas, their buses are taken off, but there are areas in uh, Merseyside who are quite affluent, whose buses have still been kept off. So there was, um, yep, yeah, we're long, <laughs> just, there. just a couple of rows in from Debbie in, in the centre. Thanks very much. Um, so bus, bus cuts are insane. In Greater Manchester, we've seen 8 million miles worth of routes cut since 2010. And what's clear is that we don't just need a slight increase in bus patronage, we need a transformation of our bus networks all across the country. Um, we need to be able to compel bus companies to deliver affordable, accessible, frequent bus services. And um, so I wanted to ask the question, how can we ensure that passengers' voices are really listened to, especially when bus companies have extremely, <laughs> they have vested interests, they've got a lot of skin in the game. We've seen that bus companies today were, had two hours to give their point of view. How can bus passengers have a bigger voice in this, when it's quite clear we're calling for better buses. Yeah, let's have a couple more and then I'm just going to try and answer really quickly some of the questions that have been posed. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alex, I'm disabled and I'm also unemployed. Um, I got given a job seeker, um, job centre plus travel card to help me travel to and from <laughs> interviews. Um, since 2015, all the rail operators have stopped me from using my card um, at peak times with off-peak tickets. I've had to sit in London Euston Station after an interview for four hours, waiting for a train up back up to Liverpool. Only one bus operator in the city, which is Stagecoach, allows me to get the cheapest rail um, bus ticket. So basically the government's saying, here's a rail card, but you can't use it for most of the day um, at peak times which is stopping me from going to interviews. And now the DWP and the DFT are fighting over who's responsible it is to sort this mess out. And the DWP have also turned around to me and said, if you want to go for an interview outside of Merseyside and the ticket costs more than £30, we don't have the money to pay that ticket back to you. So basically, I'm unemployed, but I can't get to interviews because the tickets on rail and bus are so expensive. Thanks for breaking that point, Alex. I'm sure all of us would agree that that's a crazy situation where you know, you're trying to get yourself into, into work and the system is working against you. It's really important that transport uh, fares are affordable. I'm going to take a couple more questions. I just want a couple of pick things up. Um, ben, on the fuel duty freeze, I don't think the committee... I have discussed that and come up with a position. I'm sure many of us uh, would have a personal position that um, the vast amount of money that's been put into freezing fuel duty, if that money had been put into improving some of our public transport services, uh, they could look a bit different. So, I, have, we, I mean, many of us have made that point, but as a committee, I don't think we've uh, discussed that and, and said that specifically. Maybe that these are some of these challenges for us to take back as a committee and... Uh, discuss um, and in terms of the Equality Act I mean I'm sure all of you would know we've got four Labour members here we wanted the socio-economic uh, impact of decisions to be considered the Conservative government disagreed with that what, what can I say it speaks for itself really but I'm going to take two more questions and then we really have to wrap up and I'm really sorry because we'd love to hear more of what you've got to say but as I say um, you know do you, you're always welcome to write in uh, to the committee and in fact as part of the bus inquiry you're right today we heard from um, a couple of bus operators and from Mersey Travel in a previous session we heard from representatives uh, of bus users from the campaign for better transport uh, and from bus users uh, UK but many individual bus passengers or passenger groups have written into us as part of this inquiry it's not too late by all means uh, do share your views and part of the reason we're here in Liverpool part of the reason we're doing uh, this session this afternoon is because we do want to hear uh, from ordinary passengers and obviously all of us as MPs hear from our constituents who are bus passengers so uh, many of the things that you've said this afternoon have been very uh, familiar right you're going to have like 30 seconds max if you've got your hand in the air but 30 seconds literally so we'll have one here and then this gentleman at the front and then we'll try and hear from the five of you who's got your hands up 
Uh, we haven't spoken about loneliness so far this afternoon, and that was my point that um, having inadequate transport did lead people to become more socially <coughs> isolated and lonely. <coughs> really important point. Thank you for making that. That's very good. Sorry. Um, my name is McDonald. I'm from uh, various groups that oppose tolls. I had a long question, which I've actually submitted by email, so hopefully somebody from the committee will supply an answer because obviously you can't now. Um, what what's, my question was pointing out is that this area seems to have been picked on yes. by <coughs> government and by parliament and, and to some extent by this committee in the past. And it's the worst affected in the whole country by tolls. So the question was in brief, why? What, why, why, are we, why are we picked on? Why do we suffer so much from tolls <coughs> and penalties which are draconian on the new bridge? Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer. I don't know why um, you, you've particularly been hit by tools, but I certainly recognise that that's a big issue. And of course, well, we really would like an answer to the email, if possible. Well, send us the email, and we'll see what we can we we'll see what right. we can do. Thank you. Yeah. So 30 seconds each. The two the two people there in a row. Um, hello, uh, my name is Anthony. I'm from the Better Buses for Barry campaign up in Greater Manchester. Um, there's just two quick questions. One is uh, related to the national planning policy. Um, local authorities are building plans for the future, of which transport needs to be included in that. And as a part of the MPPF, they have to write transport assessment. Uh, but we're not bringing the biggest provider of transport to local communities to the table. Uh, e.g. bus companies, um, so how are local authorities supposed to write a meaningful transport plan without them at the table? And um, quickly, my second point is specifically to do with the MP from London's point around the, the, the schemes they've got there. Uh, there's loads of money spent down there. Uh, how are we justifying, uh, and yourselves as a scrutiny committee can tell me this, uh, how are we justifying spending billions on Crossrail and HS2 when local transport is crumbling? Literally, people can't get to work. My name is David, retired bus and train professional. Perhaps you might like to take evidence from uh, the Liverpool Mayor um, uh, as to why he's done away with the, all the bus lanes, all the bus priorities, effectively therefore giving priority to the motor car. We've heard a lot about politics here today and we all have our own views on politics, but there we have a Labour Mayor who has done away with bus priorities. Elsewhere in the country in Birmingham you've got a Tory uh, who is actually introducing bus priorities. So I think it's a little bit more than politics and that irrespective of whether the ownership is in the public sector or the private sector, irrespective of whether or not we've got deregulation or not, if the buses can't get through the service will be rubbish. Perhaps you might like to take evidence from Councillor Anderson to see why he wants the bus services to be rubbish. Well, uh, we specifically asked the people who we had in front of us this afternoon about pro bus priority measures and about uh, bus lanes because, of course, we were well aware of that uh, decision made a few years ago and equally uh, slightly mystified by it. So, uh, certainly, let's just ca capture the last couple of people who wanted to ask a question and I'm really sorry we're going to have to fly in order to catch our trains back to London. Sorry. Hi there, yeah, my name's Zoe. I'm actually blind, so I, I use trains mostly to travel, but I just wanted to um, ask about a specific area um, that you mentioned kind of as part of a list earlier. You were talking about that the Select Committee, committee um, is looking at different elements of disabled travel, but you mentioned very much in fleeting terms um, the uh, audio announcements or display, uh, the screen displays on bus. I, I just wonder where we're getting to with... Um, any, any progress on sort of announcements on buses because I use Mersey Rail trains and they're absolutely A1 in terms of accessibility because they, they, they announce all the stops. Um, I, I use very few buses independently because they don't. I'm just wondering um, what progress the select committee have made in terms of that, that specific issue. What bus company is saying about it? Um, are they interested in it? Is it like a going to be a universal thing or are we having to wait for each bus company individually? Because if you go to Wales, in North Wales, I know this isn't your area but they have it on the, the bus routes there, so there's obviously an inconsistency. I'm just wondering um, whether that issue is being addressed, really. Um, I'll just answer that one really quickly. Um, thank you, Zoe, for your question. In my own city of Nottingham, every single bus has audiovisual uh, announcement, as it does uh, in London. There's going to be a requirement that all bus operator, big bus operators have got to have it in place 
uh, by 2021. We've challenged them a number of times uh, in the committee about the fact that actually bus um, th those audiovisual announcements are helpful for all bus users, not just uh, people with disabilities. Everyone finds it useful, particularly if you're travelling in a, a new area, uh, to be told uh, where, where, which stop is coming up and when you've arrived at uh, your destination. So we'll keep pushing uh, on that and thanks for raising so it. We did and, we, and we did earlier this afternoon uh, as well and I'm afraid that bus operators, they, they tend to go on about how expensive uh, it is, particularly for retrofitting. It's really disappointing that they take that attitude. Um, I think there's one last person who's waiting for a, with a question. Maddie McGivern, the 101 Action Committee. We've, we've got the support of councillors, we've had the support of the MP, and Maisie Travel just doesn't listen, right? The 101 bus has been run over 36 years. In July 17, after the usage of passengers, and these are Maisie, these are Maisie Travel's figures, 196,599 passengers used the 101 bus. Of them, 137,464 were concessionary passes. Now to us that tells you about the number of disabled and the elderly people that actually used that service. And yet Maisie Travel chose to close that service down. We've lobbied, we've campaigned, we've stopped buses on the streets, we've put in petitions. When we asked, they did a so-called consultation and when we asked Maisie Travel, what, could we have the minutes of the, of the, the committee or whoever it was that uh, discussed the uh, consultation data that was received back, there is no such, there are no minutes. There is no, there is no internal records whatsoever in relation to the 101 bus. So to us, the, the, the so-called <coughs> consultation was a sham. In, 16, seven, in the year 1617, 30 million pounds was spent on buses by Maisie Travel. They took in 12 million pound income. The following year, they cut it to 27 million, but they only took in 9 million income. And when we asked about the 3 million pounds, and we asked the chair of Mersey Travel, well, why did you cut the buses by 3 million pounds, or the bus budgets? And he said, well, it was because of the cuts and we had to do it. And we said, well, you only took in 9 million instead of 12 million. In all, you only made or saved 30,000 pounds. Now, We've, we've come up with all kinds of figures and we've asked questions and we, we never really do get the right answers or the right responses. The chair of Mersey Travel himself said that that bus wouldn't go on. He promised our committee, came to a meeting, told us that, the, or even though the decision had been made, that he would make sure that that bus wouldn't go on. It never, but it, it wouldn't go off, but it did go off. And he came back and he said he was very embarrassed. He personally was very embarrassed in promising us uh, that the bus would go back on when in fact it didn't. Now somewhere up above, someone else is making those decisions to actually tell the <coughs> chair of Mersey Travel, Liam Robinson, that that bus couldn't go back on. So uh, well, there are lots and yeah. lots of information, of but we do not get the answers from Mersey Travel. So we'd like an inquiry, into, an, an actual inquiry into how Mersey Travel is running the, the bus operations in this city, uh, in Mersey Town. Thanks very much uh, for your question. You made a really powerful point and obviously we're going to be sending all of the details about what you've asked uh, to uh, Mersey Travel and to the operators so they can see the questions um, and I hope that we're able to uh, get you some answers on the things that obviously fall outside the remit of this, um, of this committee because our job is to scrutinise uh, central uh, government but you know that doesn't mean that the issues you haven't raised uh, are important. We're, because we've listened to all the questions, we've run out of time uh, to answer them. Um, but thank you so much uh, for coming along this afternoon and for making all the points you've made so very uh, powerfully. I think you know all of us have really enjoyed listening to what the issues are, um, and we'll be trying to well both feed those into the continuing work that we're doing on this inquiry, particularly into buses, but into our wider work of trying to hold uh, central government to account about the issues that matter to ordinary uh, passengers up and down the country, including here in Merseyside. So uh, thank you very much. I hope you found it a useful afternoon. I'm really sorry we have to cut it uh, short. Thanks.